course is such a clear teaching in non-duality and defenselessness and meekness. I was using the example of um, Jesus is teaching, if somebody asks for your coat, offer your cloak as well. You know, like this sense of abundance, not the sense of scarcity or lack, just abundant love. Love everyone abundantly. Don't contest things, don't, you know, don't try to make a, have a confrontation at all. I even used this, one of the first two Course in Miracles students on the planet was Bill Thetford, who helped collaborate with Helen Schuckman. And in his later years, he would go to course groups, mostly quiet. Occasionally he would teach, he smiled a lot, and he was just <laughs> happy and peaceful and didn't really have a lot to say. He would just show up and smile at everybody and hug everybody. But there was one time when two course students started arguing about a passage, the interpretation of a passage in the course. And Bill spoke up and said, it's better to rip the page out of the book than to argue and fight with your brother. And I thought, wow, that's, that was one of the first two, it was, that was a good practical application about not contesting. And then, yeah, back in the 2000s, the early 2000s, um, there was not one, but, but actually seven copyright lawsuits going on. Seven copyright lawsuits about the ownership of the book and the words and, and who wrote the book. I mean, it was registered with the, as guided with the copyright office as anonymous. Um, and Helen Schuckman, um, but anonymous first, and then Helen Schuckman, who was the scribe. Um, but then during the trial, you know, the whole thing of control of words and who owns things and this and this, uh, it was, there was ruling in favoring one group. There was, I, I gave them the whole context of that because that's something that's kind of an extreme teaching example when you have seven lawsuits going on over all around a book. Who owns it, who distributes it, and whether it can be freely made available publicly or whether it's copyrighted. And it's, the copyright did hold the book together, so it wasn't kind of just picked apart. Um, so it wasn't initially put in the public domain, so it could actually stay together as a cohesive teaching text and workbook and teacher's manual. But after three decades, eventually Judge Sweet I uh, like the name of the characters, was the judge in New York who threw, threw it out, basically said it, it had gone, it had been passed out in the public domain. It was in the public domain because it had been passed out in the early years, mimeographed and Xeroxed, not to relatives or colleagues or whatever, but to groups of people that were interested, which the judge said are not related. We would say they're quite related. <laughs> Um, because of their quest for truth, but to, to the judge, it wasn't relatives or colleagues, so it was put in the public domain. And then this morning, I got this email because there's yet another copyright lawsuit has flared up, even in this day and age, in this decade, another one in Germany, and it's over the foreign translations of A Course in Miracles, specifically in Germany. So. Uh, <coughs> And I knew it was it had gone to court, and I hadn't heard much about it. Just people trying to gather lawyers again and ask people to donate money to pay lawyers to go into court to attack and defend and so forth. And and really, we are called to forgive, forgive the world, and and realize. That, I mean, some people would say the court is imprisoned by these people; it needs to be freed and. Years ago, they broke into the, some of you have heard of Edgar Cayce, um, famous psychic. Uh, Helen Schuckman had passed along a copy of A Course in Miracles to Edgar Cayce's son, Hugh Lynn Cayce. Um, and some of you have heard of A.R.E., very famous um, in Virginia Beach and so on and so forth. So there was a copy of this early version of the Course in A.R.E. library. And then a group of people broke in and stole it. <laughs> and that's how the world, then it got on the internet and everything like this. And, and a group of people said, 
we freed the course. And I said, it was never in prison. <laughs> you think breaking in and stealing is something that Jesus would, would recommend. Maybe you should go back to the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Thou shalt not steal, you know. He was here to lift the law higher. He wasn't here to overthrow some very good commandments for, for the, from the old days. And so, you know, there's those that want to protect the course, which it doesn't need to be protected either, but the protectors and then the freers. <laughs> so protect the words, free the words. You know, it's, it's crazy. It's just more ego, subtle ego tricks about trying to make the error real, as if there's something really out there happening and something you have to do take action to protect and defend or free, you know, that way. So anyway, that was years ago. That was, that's ancient history back in the 2000s. And then today, I got this email. Now, the, the sender of the email uh, put me on the email, among with other people, and this is a teacher of the Course who is claiming enlightenment, much like back in the old days, one of the rebel groups that was in the copyright controversy that had lawyers had a, a teacher who claimed enlightenment and went to court, uh, even though Jesus talked about the meek inheriting the earth and and if somebody smites you on one cheek, turn the other cheek and someone off wants your coat off from your cloak as well. And in the course, it's in my defenselessness, my safety lies. If I defend myself, I am attacked. The clearest teachings on the planet of, uh, I mean, I think, I think back to the Gospel of Thomas. They finally discovered in ancient times the Gospel of Thomas. And Thomas, other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we had the Gospels. But Thomas had some great teachings from Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas. And the shortest teaching from Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas was a great two-word teaching. I mean, I feel like the most famous ones are from the Sermon on the Mount. My famous two-word teaching is, judge not. <laughs> that kind of, wow, you can, if you can go into that in full application with those two words, you've got it. I mean, that, to me that's the, the epitome of the Sermon on the Mount. But this was a, another two words that I really, it was the shortest teaching recorded from Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas, other than Judge Not. And it was, be passers-by. That was the teaching. Be passers-by. And I was like, wow, that is amazing. That was, be passers-by, period. It was, that was a you can imagine the Christ uttering those words in just all the fullness of presence. And in the Course in Miracles, there is a lesson that's in the Course, and it's Lesson 128. The world I see holds nothing that I want. Hi, Radiance. Aloha. <laughs> We're just we're just going into a beautiful two-word teaching. Be passers-by. Like ships in the night? Yep. Thank you. And it's from, from the Gospel of Thomas. From the ancient Gospel of Thomas. So welcome. Settle in. <laughs> and um, I, I got an email I'm going to share with everybody. But um, actually, Lesson 128 is, The world I see is nothing that I want. And there's a line pretty early in the lesson, where Jesus says the, something to the effect of, the, he starts out the sentence, the only value that this world holds for you, he starts out the sentence. You know it gets your attention when Jesus Christ starts out the sentence, the only value that this world holds for you is that you pass it by and look no longer to find anything of value in it. So there's that B passers by. It's a longer sentence, but it's really, it's the same thing. The only value that this world has is that you pass it by. In fact, that's what forgiveness is. It's, it reminds me of that song, pass me by, pass me by. If I don't happen to like to pass it by, pass me by. This is saying pass the world by. And 
And you know, that's kind of another word for release. A lot of times when people think of for forgiveness, they think of releasing grievances, releasing judgments, releasing attachments. You know, release, that's another way to pass by. When you release something, you, you're not engaging with it. You're not activated by it. You're not trying to fix it, change it, order it, control it, so on and so forth. So this email I got today actually was from a, a teacher of A Course in Miracles who is over in Europe and he, you know, he says he's an enlightened teacher, but this email came to me from, to start off with, the top part of the email was from the enlightened master. And I always like to get these emails from enlightened masters because I don't know. Do you have a name? Uh, yeah, but we're recording, so let's just keep it. <laughs> let's keep it impersonal. <laughs> just get the name ready. It starts off, guys. Do not underestimate the desire for some to control others! Exclamation point. This is just one more demonstration of the attempt to control the use of ACIM by those who have monetary issues that obviously need to be healed. I'm sure that Jesus wants his ACIM to be spread to everybody in the world and not controlled by some who decide for others what they can and cannot do with his wonderful teachings. There is now more than one legally recognized copy of ACIM in numerous languages available to all people in this world. There is no longer any need to protect ACIM from those who use it in Jesus' name. Exclamation point. I encourage everybody to pray that Jesus sets his teachings free for everybody to use to spread the good news of the FACT, capital F-A-C-T, of a spiritual God and the illusion of a, the perceptual projection called the universe. Okay, that's the way the email started out. But there was that line in there about, I urge everyone, everybody to pray that Jesus sets his teachings free. And I mean, I have been teaching for years, many years, that the teachings don't need to be free. It's the mind that believes in the ego and believes that there's actually a world out there, and is perceiving sides, and perceiving fragmentation, and perceiving opposites, duality and multiplicity, that's the mind itself that needs to be free. In fact, I like that in The Matrix when, you know, Morpheus gives this training program, lots of training programs for Neo, you know, the, the one with the, the kind of the battle with him and, and Neo, and then also the, uh, the scene where the girl in the red dress comes and so were you listening to what I was saying or were you paying attention to the girl in the red dress? And then he freezes it all. He gives gives some training. But I like the one when they go on the roof of the building and he says to Morpheus says to Neo, you know, I want you to free your mind is what he says. Free your mind. And then he jumps from the top of the roof onto the top of the roof of the other skyscraper. But I liked what he said before he did it. It was more like, here, here's some transcendence, you know, look at this, watch out. But free your mind. So, I've been teaching for many, many years, it's the mind that needs to be free. The Course doesn't need to be free. You know, it's like, talk about the, like try, the Iron Curtain and trying to free countries and beaming light into these poor countries, or these countries where there's all this fighting that's going on, that's a common thing. It's, we talked about affirmations one time, beaming light, sending light to Kosovo, or you know, over to the Middle East, or whatever, beam love and light, and this and this, or, or freeing people. I mean, a lot of times people will tell me, you know, I'm so happy I live in a free country. And I say, what do you mean? And they say, well, you know, not my a communist country, or a dictatorship, or something like that. And I go to countries like China and whatever they were called, communist, <coughs> and we talk about the same ideas and cry and laugh and rejoice and have miracles. And it's just this idea of free countries, free people, 
I mean, you start to even question, even if your body's in, in a prison, Gandhi was in, Gandhi and Mandela spent most of their lives in prison, if you look at the number of years, and Gandhi had a heck of a good time, exchanging vegetarian recipes, and did most, a lot of journaling and writing, publishing magazines. He wasn't imprisoned. That was, that was a great demonstration. Both of those men were great demonstrations that you can't really imprison the soul, unless you believe in the ego, when you keep judging and condemning and whatever, and then your soul feels sick. <laughs> you might say, that's, that's a trapped soul, or that's a, an imprisoned mind. But we have to start to get away from the idea that, that people are imprisoned, really, because that's part of the trick. Then you try to free them, and it never ends. You know, you try to free all the, the people, and you have the same problems. You, know, you try to invent vaccinations, you try to use medicine to cure diseases. What have we learned over the centuries? The new diseases come. We, <laughs> you cure polio and then you got AIDS. And, you know, it's just cancer, heart disease, you know, and then you cure some and then you get more new ones. Just never, it's perpetual, you know, because the world, you can't find the solution in the world. So anyway, I got this in the morning about praying to set his teachings, Jesus is free for everybody to use the good news. And, and again, it just reminded me what I've been talking about for so many years, that, uh, that it's the mind that is freed through forgiveness. And you can do it this very instant. You don't even have to wait for that one. You just have to thoroughly let go of everything you think you think and think you know. All of opinions, judgments, attachments. Isn't that the way to enlightenment? I mean, everybody intuitively can even feel that. Free your mind of attachments, judgments, grievances, uh, conditioning. Um, I would say linear time, the belief in linear time, so you can spring into simultaneous time and the holy instant and, and be as God created you. So then, that was a, written in response to an update about the update about the copyright of A Course in Miracles in Germany. The Foundation for A Course in Miracles, F-A-C-I-M versus New Christian Academy, Endeavor Academy in Germany. Wustovich, I have to say that word. Where's you go? Wustovich, am I saying it right? Wustovich? We don't even know. <laughs> It's a, it's a town in Germany, oh. Wustavich, Germany. You probably got it. And give thanks. See, Judah's actually translating some of my writings and some of our writings into German. We have to, this is like now the copyright case. It's like, oh, who controls those German words? <laughs> um, give thanks to all the students and teachers of the Course in Miracles all over the world for any help we have received from so many of you in this trial. Your support has encouraged and backed us in our move for an unequivocal decision about the authorship of A Course in Miracles, whereby we reject the copyright, A Course in Miracles, and the demands of F-A-C-I-M. The authorship, now there's a good one. We, we talked with Earn about that topic up last time I was here about the authority problem. There we go, we're getting down to the core teachings of A Course in Miracles and the practical application. And this involves the authorship. It's, you know, when I was just in, in Honolulu the last few days, I did remember one of those YouTubes. I love it when people do YouTubes of my teaching, and I love the titles they come up with <laughs> for them. I'm like, well, look at this one. But one that really caught my attention was, Who's Your Daddy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to click on that one. That's, <laughs> that's how I, I watch these things too, because I'm like, Ooh, wow, that's, ooh, that's, that's good, that's good. But who's Your Daddy? And then I did a whole teaching for like an hour on Who's Your Daddy? Um, because it all comes down to authorship. Are we authored, are we a spirit? being authored by God. Is God the author of reality? Or is the ego the author of reality? And God authors reality and God says, you know, it, it's beyond words, it's just spirit creates spirit creates spirit and love is love is love. I mean, 
I was saying this, these past few days, even in this world, we get apples from apple trees, right? And we get peaches from peach trees, pears from pear trees, bananas from banana trees. So you'd think in heaven, we would get spirit from spirit. We wouldn't. It wouldn't be like God's, oh, I'm going to make, I'm going to create the Christ, and then I'm going to, yeah, let's do some more. So we create some angels, and then, whoops, a fallen angel. Oh, oh, Satan. Well, that doesn't, wow, how would you get Satan from God? If, you, if we get apples from apple trees, you know, even in this world, you get children from parents, but I mean, it's a pretty big stretch to try to trace back Satan to God. Now that God created angels and then, oops, oh, oh, there, oh, there goes a bunch of them. Oh, man. First one, Satan, and then, oh, there they go. They're gone. <laughs> how, how do you get a perfect God, perfect love? They used to teach us all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful. Whoops, where do you get a fallen angel out of all-loving, all-knowing, all-powerful? If we just use any kind of logic and we apply it to divinity, we have to start to say, that's, there's something fishy about that. And then there's something fishy about Genesis in the Bible, you know. And God created the heavens, and the earth. Wait a minute. God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens are eternal. And what do we know about time and space from my last talk here when I was here with our Armelis? It's finite chaos is what it is. <laughs> the scientists have told us, you know, it's definitely finite, you know, it's definitely not, nothing lasts forever. Nothing in form lasts forever. It's not eternal. So, Okay, so this is, where do, where do Adam and Eve come in? God created Adam. I watched a funny comedian, um, Bill Moore, uh, doing a stand-up comedy. And he's like, God, why would God create a son? A son, why does God need a son? Why does God need a child? You're, you're infinite, you transcend time and space. No beginning, no end. Why would God create a son? Referring to Jesus, the man, you know creating a son, and I'm sending you to Earth on a suicide mission. <laughs> you know, it's going to go okay for like 33 years, and then it's going to get nasty. And then gonna, I'm going to send you down, and, and it's going to be a suicide mission, but just don't hold that, you know. Go, it's, it's not going to hurt, yeah, maybe at the end, at the end, it, you know, it could get bloody and nasty, but Bill Moore, you know, <coughs> Why does God need to have a son, a child? Why does eternal eternity need a child? What the Course would say is it's, it's spirit. Christ is pure spirit. So Christ is just an identity of who we are, created by God and spirit. So, you know, we're one with God. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. We're the same spirit. We have, we have a home in heaven, not on earth. But this whole idea of Jesus and a lot of Christians say, God came to earth. Why, is he, why does God have to go to earth? Well, God needed to experience himself, so he needed some finite, temporary flesh, you know, and some pain and pleasure and, you know, death and murder and disease and uh, some kiwis and fruits thrown in and some good stuff and everything, but you know. But God needed to create Adam and Eve and mankind so God could fully know the fullness of that's a bunch of malarkey. What does eternity need to go messing around with duality for to know itself? When duality is the absolute denial of oneness. There's nothing that's one on this planet. There's absolutely nothing. It's just pure multiplications and fragmentation. What do we have? The Big Bang. Boy, that's a lot of images and then it just keeps exploding. Now we have advertising. We thought we had images before. <laughs> you turn on the TV lately? Cable TV? I was just visiting a, they put me in a home when I went to Honolulu. A group home. <laughs> my bedroom was next to the guy with the dementia. <laughs> and, and boy was he having trouble, oh, he was having fun I guess with the, the remote. He was changing that channel, I thought, whoa, I, now I know how many stations you can get in Honolulu. <laughs> the TV going like this, and advertisements 
Come on down, 1995, call the day. <laughs> Come on down, you can get a car for a reason. You know, just all the advertisements, all the soap operas, all the game shows. Bzz, wrong answer! You know, then, as I'm in my room meditating, I'm like, whoa, whoo. <laughs> it's just an explosion of images. That's what the Big Bang was. It was an explosion of planets and stars and dust and black holes and everything. Now look at Earth. We've got advertising. Gosh, you turn on the TV. It's the multiplication of images. What does all these images have to do with oneness? Nothing. What does it have to do with I amness or God before Abraham was I am? Nothing. Why would we stay attracted and addicted to all these Images, like Shakespeare said, much ado about nothing. It seems like we finally would go, well, I kind of like that teaching in the Bible, be still and know that I am God. Ooh, something that resonates about that direction. So, to get back to the email, <laughs> which got my attention to standing off this morning. So this is giving me an update on the Course in Miracles copyright, another one. We had seven of them before and then I thought we were through with that, but apparently not. And then it's talking about, thank you for your support. Okay, now it finally gets down to update. The first round before the trial court in Frankfurt was decided in favor of FACIM. Sounds like a boxing match. The first round. <laughs> <laughs> and this is being forwarded to me by an enlightened master. And then commentary on the update, and here's the update. We appealed to the next higher court to challenge the first court's decision. Our statement of grounds for this appeal was submitted in November 2013. That's this month. It's going on right now. This next higher court, oh my, it's a German word. It's a long one. <laughs> it's a long, long German word. <laughs> oh, the experts. Oberlandesgericht. Oberlandesgericht. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> and I'm supposed to have a German background. Hofmeister. <laughs> Next higher court, the Oberlandesgericht in Frankfurt, will now examine the previous decision. The opening for this trial is set to February 2014. Trusting in Jesus Christ, the truth and God, we are determined and confident that we will to convince the court of our sound and good reasons in this case. If necessary, we will go to an, another step further to the federal court, probably like our Supreme Court, probably have different layers. Mm -hmm. You get a bad decision you don't like, go to a higher court, go to a higher court. Jesus actually has a teaching in the text about this, where he says, no matter whatever kind of case you build against your brother and sister, you know, your grievance, and they wronged me, and I've been violated, and all this stuff, he, he says, take it to the higher court. He's meaning the Holy Spirit is the higher court. And the higher court, Jesus tells you the outcome already, will dismiss the case. <laughs> Whatever case you can come up with against your brother and sister, take it to the higher court and the court. Now in this world, the higher court rules. They were, you know, nice big robes and back in the old days they used to have like in Great Britain they had wigs, powder wigs, you that here in the United States. <coughs> White wigs and gavel. I make the ruling. But our higher court, the Holy Spirit, will dismiss the case. Always. The Holy Spirit's not going, hmm, that's pretty bad. No, the Holy Spirit's like, get out of here. <laughs> Come on. What are you doing? You're not going to be peaceful if you keep up. Case dismissed. Case dismissed. So, at the very end in bold, any financial support is wholly appreciated, exclamation point. Our donation account, and they give you the, the bank account. For transfer outside of Germany, blah, blah, blah. I have a number. Uh, our PayPal account is <laughs> for easy and direct use of your credit card. <laughs> fight these villains. Thank you very much. So that was one of the, yeah, I had just been talking in Honolulu about 
There are no sides. There's nothing to defend. There's nothing to protect. There's, it, it, that's what forgiveness shows you, the sameness of all the images. That, that in the end, when you bring all the images back, when you bring back the projection to your mind, you see that they're all in one mind, and they have, ideas leave not their source. In heaven, Christ never left the mind of God, and even in earth, when we forgive, we realize that there's nobody out there. Everything that we've been concerned about, every issue, every grievance we've held, every judgment, we simply denied it from awareness, and then it got projected out and acted out by a character in the dream, and we thought they, they did it to us, you know? And this idea of projection, first denial, and then projection makes it seem as if, when your mind's asleep and dreaming, as if there are characters other than the character that you identify with that are doing things to you. And some of them, the ego would say, are not nice. It's, it's nasty. And it's, it's bad. Wrong. Bad, bad, bad. Or sometimes they'll say, it's a crime. Being violated. And we have interpretations we call murder, rape, terrorism or just destroying Mother Earth, destroying, raping the, the, the rocks and the minerals, taking the oil from Mother Earth and everything. Mother Earth gets raped and pillaged, human beings, animals. Somebody wrote me today too about the animal slaughterhouses and you know, killing the, the chickens and the cows and the pain and the suffering of the animals and how do we stop all this. It's you know, yada yada yada, it's the same thing that we have to first come to an admission that to believe in the ego, to believe in separation from source, is the central, it's the one problem, and we can only have it corrected in the mind where the problem is. The ego is not in the world. We can't go, oh, that's, that is unacceptable, that is ego behavior. You see, we project the ego out onto behavior. Now we're telling somebody like in the email, Naughty, naughty. There's people out there, real people, trying to control the course. It's not right. The course needs to be freed. Please donate now. Let's get some good lawyers in there and fight those evil foundation for a course in there called <laughs> villains. Smash them. Knock them down. So we can have the course free in Germany, maybe free in Austria before you know it. It's free in France. Slowly, freedom rings. Of course, book gets little wings and can fly to further, <laughs> more countries. Can go down to Africa. Where people can, you know, the characters down there, tribal things. They can they start translating it into new, different languages, and reaching the the Aborigines who don't really need it in the first place. They have a, a heightened consciousness, they're already tele telepathic. And uh, it's for the intellectuals, the ones that education, no well-read, you know. It's the Course, like Helen Shuckman even said, at last a pathway to God for the intellectuals. <laughs> she didn't say, at last a pathway to God for the Aborigines. <laughs> because, you know why she never was quoted as saying that? Because they don't need it. <laughs> they don't need it. <laughs> No, it's all connected. <laughs> they spent centuries praying and meditating and drumming and coming, taking hallucinating drugs and ayahuasca and ecstasy and all these things. And Sounds just like Kuna. <laughs> yeah. And they, and they go into this bliss because, and they're telepathic, they, they're like, wow, we are connected. We're all the same one. We must be the, the real Aboriginals, the descendants from them. Here we go, Radiance Grace, leading the Hawaii the Puna District <laughs> Aboriginals. <laughs> so anyway, I give that just example because then I was telling them, you know, the whole spiritual journey is 1% principle and 99% practice. So once we get clear to be meek, defenseless, gentle, happy, joyful, peaceful. We see this, that's who we really are, and then, then we just practice 
in our seeming daily lives to transfer the training with everything. It could be with a mosquito, you could practice this, you know, and some people that's a pretty good test. <laughs> Practicing, somebody wants your coat, offer your coat as well, if you practice that with a mosquito, as they come and land on you, it's like, oh, oh <laughs> take my cloak as well. Or do, you, or, do you, or do you react in a defensive manner because you have a past association with this insect? And you have a past memory of something you believe that actually it did to you in the past, and you, you react from a past way, or you, no, I have come to bring peace. And do you offer it? You see, we get to practice on a daily basis with everyone and everything. I tell the story one time where we went all the way down to Australia, Tia and I were talking about, she says, what an island, you know, there's no snakes here. Like where she comes from, the monster snakes, it's so big that take your baby and <laughs> that's the end of the baby when the snake is the baby. I mean, these are big snakes, big birds and big alligators. Crocodile, crocodile, Dundee, crocodiles. She says, no snakes here. I said, yes, we have nice fruit, fruit trees and <laughs> mongoose and stuff. She said, they're so cute. If there was a snake, they'd probably eat the snake. <laughs> the snake wouldn't last. But we were talking about that, and when I went to Australia with Kirsten one day, we were sitting down, we went, we were sitting down, and she was sitting in a couch across from me, and we were meditating. And it was like the Dharma brothers, you know, we're just, meditating, meditating. We weren't in prison, but we were just sitting there on the couches meditating, meditating. And <laughs> so finally I could open my eyes and just this beautiful fly, beautiful fly, like in Dharma Brothers, the fly on the ceiling. The fly, this was a buzzing fly. And so, and the fly would come over and look at me, and I thought, oh, it's horrible. Over here, and the fly. And so, you know, doing the fly thing. And then the fly thought it would explore Kirsten, too. And so, and over there. And then, Kirsten finally opens it. But her eyes were a little different. She was like... <laughs> <laughs> she was... <laughs> so, I watched as the fly did the thing. And Kirsten looked around and saw there was a paper near her. And saw her reach out to get the paper. <laughs> Got the paper. Started rolling the paper up. <laughs> And she put the paper in her hand. And the fly, bzzz, the fly took off and came back over to me to sit on my knee. And I was across the room and turned right around. Like. <laughs> it was very hilarious to see this fly You'd actually turn right around and just, and she's the paper looking across the room. You know, this is where you get to put the course into practice. Meditating with the fly. It's just a sound. It's just a little prickly sense of light sensation, but it's no different. That's what they teach in the Vipassana. It's let all the sights, sounds, sensations, let them all go. Let them drop away. You know, drift, sink down beneath all the thoughts and sights and sounds in, into this deep training where you, you transcend them all. There's not a sight or a sound that can disturb you or take your peace away, or even distract you, you know. It's just beautiful. It's the, it's the mind training of the mystics and the saints. And, and really, you know, in Zen Buddhism they have, they call it open-eyed meditation, where it's not, you're not just sitting with your eyes closed, you sit with your eyes open. And isn't that what we're going through every day? That's what daily life is for us. It's, it's a walking, 
open-eyed meditation, seemingly with time and space going on all around the body. And, you know, even me over there in Honolulu at the group home, you know, with this guy with dementia, just flipping through his TV channels, you know. It's just all opportunities to, to go inside and sink into what's truly valuable, which is our peace of mind and our stillness, and not be tempted to believe that there's something in time and space that's actually worth giving our attention to. Be passers-by. That's what Jesus was teaching in the Gospel of Thomas. Be passers-by. And certainly, even with court cases, it's like, well, well, that's interesting. It's a court case, but, but we're really not asked to take sides. And that goes against, you know, some of us have gone through self-concepts where we've been social activists. You know, we want to protect something, we want to save something, whether it's, it's food, or it's a culture, or it's a, you know, it's, my gosh, this, this world is Issueville. <laughs> <laughs> After you, you come to this planet and you've landed an issue there. How are you doing? I got an issue. <laughs> you hear that all the time. You don't look very happy. I got an issue with what you said. I got an issue with what that person did when I was on the highway. You know? I've got an issue with his food. I got an issue with the temperature. Can you turn the temperature down? Turn it up. Turn it down. Turn it up. <laughs> too hot. Too cold. Too hot. Bring me the food. This is too cold. Take it back. This is too hot. Take it back. No, it's, it's an issue. It's not accepting that it's all mine. And the Course is saying, let all things be exactly as they are. It's just saying, you know, what peace you would have. Actually, in the workbook, Jesus says, to the effect, what could you not accept if you but knew that everything, every event, every circumstance, every happening is, is planned by one for your good. It's planned for your good by one, meaning the Holy Spirit. It's all orchestrated just so you won't judge it. And then when you don't judge it, you behold it in its glory. You go, oh my God, it's perfect. Oh! God has always been perfect. It's always been perfect. I was just judging against it and thereby missing its perfection by putting up a filter of judgment, breaking it apart. Hmm. Like a jigsaw puzzle, many, many pieces. And then once they're all put together, oh, look at that, the, piece, the puzzle is together. All the pieces fit <coughs> just perfectly. You know, that satisfaction when you see the, the wholeness, the completed puzzle, the big picture. You know, that's what we're doing spiritually. We're just going inside to find the big picture. We, we know there's a big picture. There has to be a big picture in there. And there is. It is a perspective. So, that's my spiel for tonight. If we can <laughs> jump into practical application, as we always do, because that's really the helpful use of time. You know, because whatever's going on in your consciousness and awareness that seems to be, you know, almost compulsive or addictive or whatever. I remember there was a guy, his name was Joe Dispenza. He was in the movie What the Bleep. Mm -hmm. We know he was like the chiropractor from down south somewhere, Atlanta or something. And he was defining in the movie, he was defining addiction. And he said, addiction is something that you can't stop. And I, ooh, that's a nice one too. Addiction is something that you can't stop. So if you have something in your awareness that you are aware of, we'll say on a, on a daily basis, or now even, and you can't seem to stop it, and it bothers you, it, it has a frustration with it, or a challenge, or a discomfort, or whatever, then that's, that's a good place to start, you know, in, in looking in the mind. Something that you can't stop. And it doesn't really matter what it is. 
um, we want to come to a place of contentment. We want to come to a place of fulfillment, of stillness, of peace, where it's just pristine. It's pristine. And there's not anything going on in there like, it could be better. Uh, if it was different, it'd be better. It could be a little bit better. You know, all the little things that, that go on that, that they're saying, no, it's not really, no, don't be content. You know, it's incomplete. And, and yet, presence, divine presence is, is completion. That's what makes it content. There's no, nothing incomplete. Nobody thinks that the kingdom of heaven is incomplete. And nobody thinks nirvana is incomplete. And if we were created by God, or by oneness, or by love, then we must be that heaven or nirvana. We must actually have that state of mind in us if we were created. We may be able to cover it over, but we certainly can't get rid of it. You know, it's too, it's real. How can you destroy the real? You can push it out of awareness and hide it, and play hide and seek in time and space, but you can't really get rid of it. So, so that's, what we talk about the practical application is if there's anything floating and fluttering and looping in there like Groundhog Day, looping around, it's got some irritation and annoyance with it, then that's, that's good to get in touch with. And then we can join together and really look at it and see, is that really so? Is that, you know, like uh, Byron Katie says, loving what is, you know, is that, is that true? Is it? Is that so? Really? Is that so? You know, it's beautiful inquiry of <coughs> really getting, is that so? Question mark. Is that, really so? is that really true? Allow yourself to let it up in awareness and then really look if it's true or not. And, and it's kind of neat when there seems to be a group of us doing that. You may have something that you think is a major problem and you let it up and everyone goes, ha, that's nothing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder of that. You know, that's, it helps to have that synergy of mighty companions, you know, reminding you that's, well, that's not really a problem. Maybe we don't have any problems. <laughs> Maybe we actually don't have any. And, and, and we would laugh at, at these ideas of problems if, if we were in that state, if we could really, really see it, we would see that we don't have any. And maybe that's life. Maybe life doesn't have problems. Maybe we've been masquerading and playing with masks so long and we forgot that it was a game and started like an in inception, you know, we were so many layers of dreaming that after a while we forgot we were dreaming. And then it started to get more serious and more serious and then Yipes! We, we got afraid. You know, we forgot the dream. David, I have a course question. I never hear you talk about cost. And I looked in the Concordance the other day, and, and half of a page of it is cost. Mm -hmm. It says cost and sin, and I think co the cost of judging, the cost of separation, all, you know, so many words you could take in the course, but cost, and I never hear you talk about that, and I wonder about that. Yeah, probably, if you go through enough videos and ideas, you'll hear it quite, quite well, a time. I too. feel like I've been through a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I'll keep looking. Well, that's, that's good. Let's really bring it out tonight on video and audio. Let's start with something from the Bible. The wages of sin is death. Let's talk about that. The wages of sin is death. Because wages fits in a little bit with cost, you know. If wages, getting paid, and then cost is almost like the flip side. That's how people can afford to buy things. Wages is more like the filling the wallet up, and cost is what takes it out. And I, can, I, I do have a copy of the Concordance, and and cost, you know, I would say it probably got, cost you your peace of mind, will cost you 
your uh, serenity, you know, cost. Um, in Christian theology, and I'm not talking the Course in Miracles, but in traditional Christian theology, the atonement was paying a ransom. A ransom is a big cost. The ransom, like humankind uh, had done something terrible to God, like, you know, take a bite out of that apple. God said, don't, here's a tree, here's a tree, and it has fruit, but there's rules. There's rules with this tree. It's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and I know, I put it here in paradise. And ask me how duality was placed by God into paradise. Doesn't make any sense why God would put a dualistic tree <laughs> <laughs> the pure oneness, it's ridiculous right away, but there's a tree of knowledge of good and evil, and there's a rule. It's just like telling a kid, don't do this. <laughs> what happens when you tell kids, don't, don't eat in the, from the candy jar? Mm -hmm. Don't eat the cookie. They'll, they'll do it. <laughs> so, here's God, so don't eat from that tree, and then they eat the apple, and then there's a fall from grace. And the fall from grace, you don't think God's just going to sit around and let you fall, be a disobedient, you know, break the rule, break the one rule, and then say, I can't let you get away from that. It's going to cost you. It's going to, mm, you have to pay me back. You did it, you broke the rule, so now you have to be punished. And uh, you have to have a, there's a ransom, you're going to have to pay a cost, not just a small cost, but you're going to have to pay a big cost, because that's a bad thing you did. It's the worst thing. You're disobedient, you broke the rule, now you have to pay the cost, and the wages of sin is death. Now you're condemned to die. And you're going to die and die and die, <laughs> over and over. Even if you have a bunch of begats. Procreating, begat, 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 die, 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 die. Oh, you think it's so good, have sex, have fun, begat, 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 begat. Die, 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 die. You're going to pay a cost, the ultimate cost, and you're going to keep dying over and over if you keep sinning and you don't know who I am and who you really are and all this and this, you're just going to keep as if God is really interacting with this crazy play that he didn't create, but that, that somehow you, there's going to be a cost and you have to pay the cost. And, and in this world, it's a world of scarcity and it's a lack where everything costs money. Eventually they might charge for air. Probably not air in your tires, but you can monitor how many breaths are you taking? That's 10 cents. Each one, you know, if you pay for many things in this world because it's a world of lack and, and it's a world of reciprocity, it's a world of cost, and so on and so forth. But ultimately, if you boil it down, the, the big cost is the belief that you separated from God. You know, that's the big no-no, is separating from the source. So in Christian theology, then it's like, well, there has to be a ransom. You've got to, it's a pretty big thing that you've done, you know, this separation, fall from grace business, so there's going to have to be a ransom. Just like if somebody kidnaps something of your son or your daughter or your dog or something, and something important and says, I'm not going to get it back unless you pay the cost. You have to pay me something for me to give it back. It's kind of like the, the, the ego's Christian version of the thing is that, you did something wrong to God, you know God's very loving, He's not really happy about the separation thing. You kind of ticked Him off. He's, he's loving, He's loving, He's loving. Don't cross Him. He can be firm. And he definitely needs a ransom now to get back there. And then Jesus is going to be, he's going to send His Son on a suicide mission, 
come and say, no, 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 this is the way that it should be, and then, boom, he's going to get crucified, and by Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lamb, the blood of the innocent one, and so on and so forth, that will pay the ransom for all humankind, and you all will be free as soon as this innocent one is slaughtered, and it's solved. Makes no sense at all to me. And, but that ransom is the biggest cost. That's a cost. It's, it's saying something costs things. Now, I would say that to believe in the ego costs you the awareness of heaven. Costs you the awareness of God. Costs you the awareness of Christ. Love, oneness, joy, happiness. And using that word in that way, it's like, wow, that's, that's a pretty severe cost in awareness, not in reality. We'll say, it's really impossible in reality, but in awareness, in consciousness, it's a, it's a big cost. And so, it doesn't surprise me that the Course uses that word cost, because I think if you went through, unless Jesus is speaking kind of tongue-in-cheek, which he does sometimes, and humorously, when people read it and they go, what's he saying? Is he <coughs> speaking a little tongue-in-cheek? Give him, he wants to joke. <laughs> Try and let him joke. But sometimes, ah, oh, I believe he said that. But actually, you know, I think that's the cost that is talked about in the Course. You know, you're talking about, you know, you've found so many times. And then people, that people don't like that saying from the Bible, the wages of sin is death, but sin is, is missing the mark. If you go back to the original Aramaic, you know, sin is not hitting the bullseye of love and forgiveness, it's missing the mark. Well, what would you expect from missing the mark? If the mark is God and love and Christ and joy and happiness and peace and you miss the mark, what do you think? You're off into Deathland. I mean, the bullseye is love, and the rest of the rings are all death. If you miss the target, fing, oh, God doesn't go, that's all right. That's close enough. It's more, it's like, you're off into error. Sin is really error. So the wages of sin is death. It's the wages of error is the experience of separation which is what death is. People don't like that saying, I think that's just good divine metaphysics. The wages of sin is death. Should rejoice. Say, well that's it, I'm, I'm going to really learn not, not to sin. <laughs> if that's the case, I, I don't want to keep missing the mark, I want to hit the mark. I want to know thyself, what the Greeks talks about. I want to, you know, realize, I want self-realization. Or may as well call it self-actualization. I would rather have that than missing the mark. And yeah, I think there is a it's, there is a cost to seeming to miss the mark. Not in reality, but in awareness. When we're not tuned in, when we're not aligned with Source, then there's the illusion of suffering. And I always say when people ask me about suffering, it's just not fun. It's just not fun. Somebody agrees with me on huh? that. Um, um, for lack of a better word, um, I just want to, this is important to you, so I'm going to tape it. Excuse me a second. Um, I'm having a, it's been going on for a while. It's an inner and an outer conflict. My studies and belief systems keep saying, trust in God, have faith, everything will be provided for. I would like to fully believe that. The reality is, is that I'm in huge credit card debt. Um, I have been living beyond my means. And um, it's a real struggle for me every month to make ends meet. And I don't know how to balance the reality of that, which is, it's real, with 
my spiritual beliefs are that God's going to take care of me. Um, I do whatever I can with my gifts and talents to provide for myself, but living in Pune hasn't been easy uh, financially. So uh, I don't know what to do about it. I'm considering filing bankruptcy because I don't know what else to do. So any insights, suggestions, viewpoints, I know this is something that probably faces everybody at one time or another, especially if they dedicate themselves to God, which I've done, and um, personal growth and um, the truth and serving others most of my life. That's been my, my life. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that when we talk about credit card debt and we just come back to the core root like debt, you know, and, and the seeming stresses around debt and the heaviness the heavy feeling around that and so forth. It's really interesting that that we're starting to understand more and more that that every single instant of every day, the mind is so powerful and the mind is choosing, is making choices every instant. A lot of the choices it's not even aware of consciously. I mean, most people, some people may remember choosing to come to Earth or choosing their picking their parents. You know, if they go back or. They can even go back in past life regression and see decisions they seem to make, you know, lifetimes ago. But there's decisions, we have to admit, there's decision going on every moment of every day. And that's the thing about the, you know, Carl Jung called it the shadow, the unconscious mind, but psychology and different things. When something's unconscious, it's out of awareness. So, when we're making decisions that are based on beliefs, and conditioning that we're not fully aware of. Even when we have good read books and we expand our consciousness and we open up, there's still some unconscious things that are still functioning. And basically, debt is is an unconscious belief. The, the belief in debt is the belief in lack, and you could trace that all the way back to the ego. Whereas in heaven, nirvana, we have everything, we are everything. It's just pure oneness. The, that belief in debt goes is synonymous with ego, and also synonymous with having an unconscious. You know, when you talk about enlightenment, what is enlightenment except to be fully conscious? Imagine instead of having two parts to your consciousness, conscious awareness and unconsciousness, that you kept raising the darkness, raising the unconsciousness up to the light, and finally it came to be like an eclipse where you went, bing, ha ha, I'm fully conscious. Uh, every decision I make during the day, I am in pure alignment with Source. And so even though there still seems to be some decisions here and there in my daily life, I'm not surprised or challenged by any of those decisions. They're so given. It's a given. Call so-and-so, go here, do this, do that. So we call it guidance. It's what fully conscious being is really just a guided being. It's guided by source. So, so what I'm hearing from you is that, that this is it's an uncomfortable situation, the debt. And I would say that that debt is is a decision, and and all decisions we're making, we're really making them. We have to really look at the here and the now because it's so tempting. Credit card debt is a great example, actually, because, because imagine that the whole idea of credit is just an invented idea. Of course, there's no credit in heaven, because there's no lack in heaven, so you don't ever have to borrow money and you don't have to pay it off on time. But that's what credit card debt is, it's paying on time. You know, you can have immediate gratification. <laughs> what do you want, a house? Okay! You can have it now, along with the mortgage, <laughs> which is credit, or credit cards, you know, we pay, you know, even a debit card uses that word debit because it, it electronically takes money out of your account, you know, and you better have something in there, otherwise the card won't even work. Because if you've got nothing in there, you've got a zero balance, your, your debit card is just not going to work. Or you end up with a lot of fees for trying to make it work. 
But what I'm saying is, what we start to train the mind and go deeper, we start to see that that this idea of of credit is a time, linear time idea. And this idea of debt is very much a linear time idea. And as long as it's stressful to us, we can admit, wow, I still have an investment, a belief and an investment in linear time. Even though all the perennial wisdoms tell us live in the moment. And that's a good that's a good direction. We still have to start to look at that investment. Now, how, how do you get out of it? Well, I would say the answer is always guidance. And, and I have had a lot of people over the years who have talked to me about credit card debt, or student loans, school loans, or you know, it's come many, many people. Even in recent, even this year, I've had a number of people who have talked about that. Some we join together and they will actually um, feel guided to go to a debt counselor. Some will join together in mind and they'll say, wow, I, I have to look at what's coming in and what's going out and and if I have been living beyond my means, then I want to stop living beyond my means. That might be something good to tell the United States Congress. Uh, print more money! <laughs> the great solution <laughs> to debt. <laughs> Print more money, you know, and print more money, and after a while, you've seen what happens with countries that do that. Because money's not worth anything after a while. It's like, you know, the boy who cried wolf at some point. This paper is just representative, and you've been so neglecting with what it represents that, that it just devalues. But I would say, with people I've talked with, some actually have been guided to go through bankruptcy. You can actually do that uh, with credit card debt. I think certain types of debt with laws changing and everything, school student loans and everything, um, in certain countries, you know, you can't, you can't, they won't even allow you to go bankrupt with certain types of loans. But you know, credit card debt, it's good to Google it and look at all the, the laws and so forth. And some people just play the lottery or go to the horse races or you know, you think, if I'm in debt, I'm going to have fun <laughs> and go play the lottery and the horses and everything. But it's, it's kind of hopeful or wishful thinking, like, I'm going to hit the jackpot and then in the future sometime, I'll be lucky or I'll have good fortune and that will solve it. But for us, we always take a look at the mind and the thoughts and really, ultimately, the thing that sets you free is starting to realize that that the decision for debt is is the decision for the ego, and that's why you're on the spiritual journey in the first place, to forgive the ego, to forgive whatever you thought you did, or whatever you thought you believed it wasn't in perfect alignment with Source. And so, more and more now, we have our communities, like we have a community here, and we have different communities around the world, and I'm seeing like simultaneously in the communities, People notice their stuff is still coming up, the stresses and the fears and the doubt and the guilt, and they're starting to hone in more to this decision idea. Like, wow, there's a choice going on, and I have a choice. I have a choice for freedom, I have a choice for happiness, I have a choice for love, and then there's another choice that, that the Course might say is a wrong-minded choice, and the wages of sin is death. I mean, the wages of error is death. The wages of, of, of misperception is death. You could say it any way you want. You could put any words around it you want. But we are really learning to train the mind to make an alternative choice, to find the alternative that, that sets us free. It literally emancipates us from from the ego. In fact, I think we have our resources over here. I decided one day to try to make it as simple as possible. And so, I made the smallest book I could think of. <laughs> so people wouldn't be overwhelmed like they look at the Bible and they go, Oh God, look at the Urantia book. 
when you look at the course, oh God, it's too big. It's just, I can't read that. I don't have the time. I don't have the time to read such a big book. But, I decide to make a small book. That is the answer to your question and the answer to everyone's questions. I thought, wouldn't that be cool? And there's a nice little figure sitting there in contentment down there at the bottom. It's even got a barcode now. Didn't used to in the old days. But but actually this this is a manual for choosing the alternative. And it's in there. Even in the Course in Miracles, in the workbook, Jesus says, in one of his workbook lessons, he says, salvation is a thought in your mind. Find it. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Jesus Christ. Salvation is a thought in your mind. Salvation being peace, joy, love, happiness, nothing more. Not some theology or whatever, but the actual experience. Find it. So actually that's what this tiny little book is about. I actually went to South America and they would listen to me for hours and they would say, Do you have a pocketbook? I'd say, No, I don't carry I carry a wallet. I said, Do you have a no no no, do you have a book? A pocket book. A book that we can stick in our pocket. It actually fits. All the way in my pocket, so demonstration. <laughs> so, 1995. Is <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that much? <laughs> <laughs> no, six. six nine, <laughs> Call now. Operators, <laughs> and the thing about it is, is this. It's the application of this. You know, if you can follow it, it's it's. Short and sweet and simple, and I think Jason uh, took this to the Swiss Alps, as the story goes. And he would he would start at the introduction, and he would he would read like a sentence, maybe a sentence. He'd go, he would go to the Swiss Alps. What are you going to do in the Swiss Alps? Just ponder, contemplate, and then. Ponder, 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 contemplate, ponder, then go on and read the second one. So it would digest it. Or follow it, is really what I would say is, that's what it's for. So this is what this was designed for. Simplicity, directness, and it takes application. But all of us are capable of following, really. You know, we, we know what logic is and we know Logic always follows, you know, you've got A and B and C. If A and B and C, you know, we can follow that. And, and we can follow metaphysics and we can follow divine wisdom. And, and we can come into the experience that purpose is the only choice. Meaning the alternative, we'll say the Holy Spirit's purpose in our mind, is really the only choice. Every time we try the other alternative, and it's been a millennium of that. We, that's what the human condition is about. We don't feel freedom of that debt. We don't feel released from debt. And yeah, credit card debt is just a manifestation of of the belief in the ego. And it's, it does rest on linear time, and that's really what this little booklet is aimed at doing, is starting to really question is time really linear? Is it really, really, is that what it is? Because we have a lot of beliefs that seem to rest on that, that belief in linear time, and this book is just kind of aimed at it. So when you ask the question, it just came to mind. Um, and also, the, just remembering that the Spirit is so practical, that that's why when I have these conversations with people that are in debt with whatever it is, we sit down and, and we pray. And we really, in a practical way, we join together. I've had people that have come to our community with student loans and, dip and different kinds of debts, um, mortgages and this and this, and 
So we just pray together and we talk about unwinding uh, from that and being guided. That's the key thing, being guided. Because there's a hope in there, like there's a promise of, of freedom. And I tell them all kinds of parables too. Uh, like my uh, grandmother and grandfather, um, when they got really up in years, uh, my grandfather seemed to get very, very sick with cancer, and yeah, there was um, lots of hospitalizations, and, and my grandfather was kind of the wage earner, and my grandmother was the bookkeeper, and they got up into, you know, ate their 80s, and, and this and that, and then this thing started to happen. So, I remember it was very practical, I would go and visit, and she would just have stacks of medical bills and they lived on social security and they didn't have bunches and bunches and bunches of insurance and so yeah that was a real practical situation for me to encounter watching her with those bills so i just watched her how would she handle that she was always like your name grace she just was grace in motion so loved and so gracious with everything and, yeah, what she would do is she would write to the, the creditors. She would write to the hospital offices and the oncologists and the, all the different specialists that had all sending in their bills, you know, for cancer treatments and x-rays and painkillers, morphine and whatever, all the things, treatment that goes on around cancer, and she would write handwritten little letters. I'm sending you what I can afford to send you this month. Adorable. Mm. Handwritten letters to these mm. medical offices, and she'd stick a five dollar mm. bill here, and a five dollar bill, and this and this and this. You know, that went over really well with the creditors, because to get a handwritten letter from somebody in their 80s, I'm sending what I can. It was a symbol of, I'm, I want to pay you what is owed. And, and this is what I can afford. And I, I, I got a lot out of that, watching her do that. I mean, at, at times in our minds it can blow way out of proportion. We think, you know, oh my gosh, it's gone. Crazy. I mean, if you looked at the United States <laughs> debt, so to speak, or m most countries actually, you know, you could say, wow, this has gotten way out of hand a long time ago. Who invented this idea of credit? You know, the forefathers, you know, I remember looking back into history and at one point they said, what we need to do, probably got together with their white wigs and we need to have some credit. We're going to be a growing country. Nobody said, I don't think that's, that's a real good idea. <laughs> that sounds kind of, that sounds, sounds kind of constricting and everything. That may, may not be good in the long run. In the long run we want to grow and expand our country and prosper. So whatever, that's, but underneath that there's just the belief in the ego. And, and that's why, you know, I think I'm grateful for a teaching that says, one problem, one solution, salvation is accomplished. To me, I like that. I, I say, well, that's okay. And then, you know, you can't, you can't project the problem to time and space. You have to face the problem in your own mind. Withdraw the blame, withdraw all your projections, and, and take total responsibility for your state of mind. Don't, don't pawn it out on anybody else, on gurus, on books or conditions or whatever. Really take full, full responsibility for your state of mind. I like that. And, and then I'm like, how? <laughs> you know, what's the thing? Well, that's what I received from Jesus, you know, and, and this particular book actually was a, a group of nurses. And actually was sitting down with a group of nurses 
one day having a discussion, and um, they recorded the discussion. And this is this the book. I'm uh, mixing that with mind overhaul. I think this is the book. I think this is the this is the nurses. So many years ago, 1990, 1990 something, early 1990s, and and we, they were just talking about their concerns with me and their stresses, and their struggles and difficulties, and and yeah, that's that's, and this was supposed to be the first book in a series. You know, like the first journal in a series of journals after it was done. Like, Whoops, that's not going to be a series. That <laughs> kind of says it all. <laughs> you know, really, that, that no part two with it. So it's, I like that. There's a simplicity about that. It doesn't have part two, it doesn't have the advanced. You know, <laughs> see. I see that with the Course in Miracles, and now the new channeling from the next. Chandler of Jesus, and it's the advanced course. What was missing in your first course <laughs> is now in your new channel version, and you can just buy this book and follow this. And actually, the course itself says this course has everything that you need. I like that. I, I like a, a pathway that tells me that it's not exclusive luck. If it tells you it's the only way to God, then this has to be, get it out of there. But if it says this is one form of the universal curriculum, and there are many other wonderful forms. Okay, I keep reading. And then when I read, this course has everything that you need, I go, okay, good. I'm glad. That's going to save me a lot of money. And a lot of shopping around to put in all the extras and, okay, buy this, but then you can buy this, 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 you know. It, I, th I think it's practical application to really go for it. Thank you very much, Jesus. I'd like to get the book. What, what is the name of the book? The name of the book is called Purpose is the Only Choice. And you might say another word for purpose is forgiveness. You know, that's what Jesus was really teaching us. He was teaching us forgiveness. but. But it's a choice, it's actually a choice in mind that's available, but, but until we whittle it down and really can see clearly what the options are, ego and Holy Spirit, then we keep making these choices in form, trying to solve the riddle. Oh, if I just have this, and if I just can choose this, you know. The world teaches us the more choices you have, the more options, the better. It's never worked. <laughs> Nobody ever found eternal life with a bunch of choices. Considering oneness doesn't have any choices. And it is oneness. We should intuitively know that it maybe is letting go of choices that might get us back to the experience of heaven instead of trying to make more choices. But the world says, no, more choices is more options. More options are better. Buy, 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 and earn, 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 and spend, 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 and get more options, and have a better lifestyle, and bigger, better, more, faster, you know, we've heard the spiel, more is better, and in A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, what is an idol, do you think you know? An idol is for more of something. It does not matter more of what. Oops. More options is not actually what it's built up to be. Because if you believe in the more is better, then you might actually go for this education thing and think that education will solve your problem. And then you need what? More education. And even when you get your degrees, you need more degrees. Mm. And even when you finally stop getting your degrees, and you go out, you start working and earning lots of money. More money, more money, more money. Then it says, well, you need now continuing education. <laughs> it's a beast that never stops. You just can't. Oh, you've got mm. to specialize. 
oh, you know this and this and this and this, but oh, you have to specialize in this. We're sorry, we have to lay you off because you don't have enough education. You need to specialize, you need to go back for more, more continuing education. Isn't it great to have a teaching that's saying, empty your mind? That's what the Buddha taught. Empty your mind. He didn't say more. He didn't say fill your mind. He said empty your mind. And that's what Jesus teaches in his, his workbook too. Simply do this. Be still. Lay aside all thoughts of what you are, all things you've learned about everything. Hold on to nothing. Do not bring with you one thought to pass this thought, nor one belief of anything you've learned before from anything. Forget this world, forget this course, and come with holy empty hands unto your God. Wow, I was reading that passage and it was like, Jesus is like, pay attention, I'm going to give it to you straight. Empty your mind. This is what Buddha had taught too. Empty your mind of everything. Forget this course. That's great. Whoever authored this course doesn't have a whole lot of investment in it either. Seems like the investment is in love and peace, not in becoming a scholar or a scribe or a Pharisee or something like that. You know, it's it's really good. So, so there it is. That purpose is the only choice. It's one of the earliest things too. I could have been stopped there. A little bit. <laughs> I was telling the people in Honolulu that I, I went to Mexico and when I was in Mexico I, was, I met this woman who lived in Chapala and she said, uh, a friend I was staying with said, there's a woman who has a machine and it costs tens of thousands of dollars. It's a very expensive machine. It's a quantum machine. And if you go and see her and you just sit next to the machine, you don't even have to hook it up to electrodes or the body or whatever. The machine will tell you everything about you. Everything. It goes through all the systems of the body. It's, it almost be like, like if you went to get your car fixed and they hooked it up to all this to tell you about the electrical system, the transmission, you know, your respiratory system, your cardiovascular system, your muscular, your skeletal system. It knows everything about your body. If you've got a parasite, or if you've got a disease, if you're on the verge of, if you have cancer, whatever, the machine, she said, costs 30, 40, 50, I forget how many tens of thousands of dollars for this machine. So I said, okay, I'll go. I'll go. I'm fearless. The machine, she said, the machine's always right, too. Doctors misdiagnosis and human error and everything, not the machine. If you've got cancer, the machine's like, you've got cancer. It's going to tell you everything, everything, everything. So I go and, and she starts with the computers, with the laptop hooked up to the computer, and she's like, hmm, oh, 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 she's very excited about the machine. And then as we go through this, this probably took two hours, she was like, telling me all the specific details and body and all the different things and minerals and systems and on and on. But I was willing to listen. And then she got to the point where she started laughing and laughing and laughing because the machine answers questions beyond all the physical stuff. There was actually one question for the machine where the question was, what is your percentage of completing your life's purpose? It's a bit more metaphysical uh, than minerals and components and whatever. What is your percentage of your life's purpose? And she started howling, laughing. And she laughed and laughed and laughed and said, I've been doing this for years and I've never seen the machine give a number like that. A score or whatever, a percentile score like that. For the question, what is your, David Hoffmeister's life's purpose, percentage of life's purpose complete, 100%. Mm. <laughs> she laughed. She just laughed. So I could have told you that one. <laughs> I know that one for sure. I know some of these other things, but I don't know so much about minerals and 
endocrine systems and this other stuff. But I do know intuitively that I can feel that. I can feel that. And then it's told foods that you, you got into foods that you can eat and foods that you're drawn to and foods that are for you and everything. They, again, my friend and the woman started laughing because the foods that were coming out on this, from this machine, they were just howling laughing because they said, we do this for so many people, we never see these recommended foods. Never. <laughs> no, it wasn't, it wasn't like Big Mac or something. <laughs> no, it wasn't. You see that on the machine. Big Mac. <laughs> you see Tim McDonald. Mac and cheese. Mac and cheese. Whopper. <laughs> yeah. as, the, as the cardiologist, the hospital looks, ah, the machine is a, this machine that doesn't make mistakes. You're ruining my career. It, it was cow's milk. <laughs> That's why they were laughing. They were like, cow's milk? They both just, you know, were really into health stuff. So they like, cow's milk? The machine says you've got 100% of your purpose complete in cow's milk? <laughs> you had to be there. <laughs> but, but so it's, you know, that's kind of interesting that, that it would say that I had completed a hundred percent of my purpose in life. I thought, it just dawned on me right now. That's the title. It's in the book. It's the only choice. Maybe that's, that's why, because I got so focused on this that I really let go of caring about everything else. When did you write that book? I think this was our, the, the, the nurses and I sat down, I think it was about 19, 1994 was the, was the year when, in Traverse City, Michigan, when I sat down with a group of nurses, or former nurses, they, they all had been to nursing school and, you know, just like a shape thing, and then, yeah, that's when this came. So that was a few years ago, so no wonder completed 100% my life's purpose. So now there's nothing left to do. Right. Isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Mm. That means I have no shoulds and ought tos in my life, in my mind anymore. So I don't, I don't sit around and think, you know, I should mow the grass or should take the trash out, or I should clean the refrigerator, or I should meditate, I should read the Course, I should find my soulmate. <laughs> Go to the end of the earth and find my soulmate. Because God is the soulmate and, and we we're created one with God, so mm -hmm. why go searching for an earthly mate if God is the soul mate? God is the creator of the soul, so that would be the best mate I could think of. Mm -hmm. Know thy creator is pretty good. Know thyself, know, the crea know thy creator is... But you don't really have to search for that. That's, that's a find. That's a discovery. That's a find. It's not a. In the end, all searching is really the, the defense against the find. Mm. We know that intuitively. The search is a defense against the find. But as long as the mind believes in the ego, oh, it's going to search blindly in form to find the right one. Seemingly in four minutes. So that's why we, we talked last time I was here about specialness and uh, how that just perpetuates like a, an endless spinning, searching, looking to find something. 
close. No, not quite enough. Here's the one. Ah. You marry my soulmate. And you wake up one day. What? You believe what? Oh, you're not my soulmate. <laughs> My soul would never say that. My soulmate would never say that. <laughs> I want a divorce. You know, it's, it goes round and round. Uh, David, one of the issues I have. You know, you told me before about addictions, but I don't want to use that word, but charges I have like, with, with my read the course of your mind when it comes to <coughs> is um it's disparagement of the world. Um and that's the part that just sort of like I get like a reaction to. Because the world is so disparaged I find in the course, as opposed to heaven. Really. Yeah. Um, I enjoy the world. I mean, I'm not saying I enjoy all the world, but I am, um, and that's one of the reasons why I thought to move to Hawaii, was to enjoy the world even more. Um, so I wonder if you and I would speak to that. Because for me, what I find, you know, one of the ways I find spirit, I get in spirit's presence is I get in beauty. Yeah. That's a good thing that you're raising in the sense that, well, there's been some great minds spoken in history about beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I think that's wonderful too because it starts to bring it back to perception and, you know, one, one person's junkyard may be another person's beautiful home. I know in India they did a whole movie, about like a whole, you know, the slums and and how these children squeal and laugh and play and run through the streets and and the little bit of water that's coming through there has got these chemicals in that environmentalists would go, oh, what? These kids are laughing and running around and they're inches away from these chemicals and so on and so forth. And so, the other thing is, is the use of the word world is used in different ways in the Course. And so, there's times where Jesus talks about the real world, and it's beautiful. He just, he's got nothing but glowing remarks about the real world. And then there's the world you made, and it's you is not capitalized. And it's kind of right. talking about the, the ego. ego's ego. Right. world. Right. We could say it's the fragmented world, or the world of linear time, or the world of separation. Um, and, of course, the ego doesn't want the mind to release or forgive that its world, because if it forgives the world, the world is used synonymous to the ego. So, when he says, you know, forgive the past and let it go, for it is gone. He's basically saying, forgive the ego and its world, its cosmos, for it is gone. It's, this world was over long ago, he says at one point. He's tying that use of world into time. Like, mm -hmm. He's saying, you know, just, it's, it's over long ago, don't try to keep bringing it into the present and tainting the present with the past. Let it go. Give up the past. Now, what I really like is, there's probably no more clear distinction between the two uses of the word world than Lesson 128 and 129. I just mentioned that earlier, Lesson 128 is, the world I see holds nothing I want. Uh, I actually did a, a gathering in Lexington, Kentucky one time from a friend of mine invited me, Mason, he's a, he was a concert violinist in the Lexington Orchestra and everything, and I was giving a talk and I mentioned Lesson 128, World I See Holds Nothing I Want. He went, ah! <laughs> I said, what? He raised his hand. That's when I quit doing the, the workbook lessons. I stopped right there. He said, I said, no. I told Jesus, no. 
that's not true. I don't believe that. And that's it. You are out. <laughs> and he stopped in Lesson 128, the world I see holds nothing that I want. And I said, oh, Mason, wow. 129 is just such a great lesson. He said, what was that? <laughs> he never got to that one. He stopped dead in his tracks on 128. I said, well, lesson 129 is the world, but beyond this world, is a world I want. He said, oh. <laughs> it's a typical Jesus. Rip the carpet out from under you and bring in all the choir of angels for what you really want. Like, like taking away a knife from a baby. You, you see the baby, the baby's got the big sharp butcher's knife somehow, very sharp, very big, and the baby's got a grasp on it, and the baby's got a smile on its face. <laughs> Why? It's got something. It doesn't even know what, but mine. And it's sparkly and shiny, and it's big, and it's sharp. And then when the parent comes in and goes, hmm, there's a baby with a big knife. And you, the parent goes over, the baby turns immediately, reflexively, to protect the knife. <laughs> it's got something. It likes it. It's a toy. Good toy. And then and the parent goes in and then tries to carefully, very swiftly and carefully, get a hold of those wrists and those arms to protect the baby, and the baby screams. The baby screams because it's, a, it's an invasion, it's an attack, it's a violation, it's a toy snatcher in the guise of mom or dead, and the scream bloody murder because you're going in out of a sense of protection, out of a sense of care and safety. And you know, basically, the ego made up its world, and it, of course it made physical and psychological pleasures, it made an alluring aspects of its dream, uh, so that the mind would never give it up. In fact, Jesus comes so far as saying, the dreams that you think you like can hold you back, as much as those in which the fear is present or as apparent. The dreams that you think you like. Uh -huh. Seven billion people, why do you think the percentage of monks and nuns out of those seven billion is so small? People are going, I don't want to be a monk. I don't want to be a nun. Why? Renunciation. Not popular. <coughs> I think a more popular line would be, Eat, drink, and be <laughs> merry, for one day we shall die. <laughs> it's more of a slogan for the world. Live it up. Go for it. Go for all the goodies of the world, for one, one day we shall die. It's almost resigning and saying, we're going to die anyway, so might as well have a good time before we die. You know? Some of you saw the Woody Allen movie where he actually had, had dancing kind of skeletons in the movie. And the song in the Woody Allen movie with the dancing skeletons was, Enjoy yourself, it's later than you think. <laughs> <laughs> dancing skeletons. You know, it's that. So, so when we start to say the Course talks about the world in a certain way, it, we have to honestly say he talks about the real world, which is synonymous with the happy dream, in a way of, or the forgiven world, in, in a way which is saying, you want this, and I'll help you 
get there. I'll help you reach the happy dream, and I'll help you reach the forgiven world. I'll do that. I'll offer, you know, the Holy Spirit is going to take you right there. But he also says, you can see this world, he's talking about the fragmented world of time and space, without help. Obviously, that's the problem. We're, we're observing the world every day without help. That's why we have the serenity prayer. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Grant me, help me, as James Brown would say, help me, help me, help me. <laughs> Don't you think that's a little more humble to saying, wow, the way I'm perceiving the world on a daily basis is not really bringing me constant peace and joy and happiness, so maybe I need some help to see another world, to, or to see the world differently, to see the world from a higher perspective, from an enlightened perspective, from a, a spirit-inspired perspective, and to me, that's that's what's so great about the Course, it just lays it out, and the only reason that Jesus speaks about the linear cosmos and the world in that way, as synonymous with the ego, is because not only the ego, it made that world, but it is that world. We have to pull our mind away from it. We've been addicted to death. We've been attracted to guilt. You know, we've actually been all wound into this deception, and he's saying, well, it's time to make a good discernment and say, you, you don't have to deceive yourself any longer. You, you can know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And, and he's taking us in towards that, I call it, healed perception, or real world. So that, those terms, that's just the way Jesus talks about it in there, but he definitely talks about world in two different ways. And admittedly, he seems to talk more about the disparaging of the ego. That's why when people read the Course, one time I was with Grace, Radiance Grace, when we were in uh, Utah there and having our talk, and we talked about affirmations, and I said, oh, it's, they're beautiful, they're wonderful, they're she said, well, the Course has a lot of affirmations. I said, it does, and it's got a lot of other stuff in there. He put, puts a lot of things in there that people wouldn't call affirmations. Talking about, you know, tears that shine like diamonds, and, and rubies, and, and then he starts talking about blood, and, and sepulchers, and skeletons. He says, you know, you know, it's like, Painting rosy lips, he says, on a skeleton. Okay, not the most poetic thing you know, near Whitman saying that. Uh, or some of these great okay, Rumi never talked about painting rosy lips on a skeleton. Go back to Rumi, it's a little softer, but he's just saying this ego thing. You don't want it. It's like poison. And you, you may think you can get by with a drop. Just a drop and he's like saying, don't go for that drop. Because your whole mind will succumb to that poison if you go for it. So we really need to, we really need to see that the ego is a death wish. There's a lot of teachings, you know, Freud said there's ego and superego and id, and the ego was the mediating force between id and superego. It was helpful. Helped you survive. Helped you make it okay on planet Earth. He was the mediator. Jesus said, no, no. It's a death wish. I was in Canada one time. When I first met Jason, he was in the audience, and I was giving a talk in Edmonton. And I was only, just started the talk. I was sitting up front, and it's, some, my friends were there and was making a talk, and I, I was only maybe five or ten minutes in the talk, and the spirit was very disparaging about the world, 
in those first 10 minutes. Then, comedians have hecklers and the woman in the front row. You have nothing positive to say about the ego. I'm hearing only negative things, she said from the front row, about the ego. She stopped me, raised her hand, stop! Stop this! You can't, not too much negative thing. So I remember I got my glass of water, took a nice long drink, put the water down, and looked her in the eye and said, the ego wants you dead. <laughs> Jason was there, and he, something in him went, whoa. He listened to the whole talk and he was like, whoa. So that's where Jason came on board <laughs> after that particular scenario. I was talking today to a friend and I do all this traveling. I travel with this friend and, you know, we stayed with some of these people and she had stopped and stayed with him and, and of this couple, the woman kept talking on and on. It was incessantly, she stopped to visit her. It was talking, 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 just talking, talking, talking. And it was all about the small self. And it just went on and on and on and on and she, she just said, started to get a bit irritated and annoyed. It's like, just like, Please, quiet, quiet, because it just was talking, talking, talking about drawing attention to the little self and everything. And then she had said to me a while back, you know, what, what do you do when that happens? Like, it's just, how, do you, how can you stand that? And, and what do you, practically speaking, what do you do? So today I reminded her of the little scenario and I said, <clears throat> sometimes people say, WWJD, what would Jesus do in that particular scenario? And, and I said, I, partic I also I particularly like J. Krishnamurti. I, I would say sometimes WWKD, what would Krishnamurti do? Because I watched Krishnamurti very closely. And I felt this explosions of love in my heart when I was watching Krishnamurti. I thought, wow, a contemporary being on this planet? i never seen anything like it. Because Krishnamurti was so patient mm -hmm. and so gentle and so deep and, and so piercing and so absolutely uncompromising and so very polite. It's quite an interesting combination to be that uncompromising and that polite. So he would be there and he would be going into this and he did this for many decades and he would be with a group of people and would start into it and then they would start in with all the stuff, questions and projections and whatever, on and on and on with all this stuff. And then there'd be a little sliver of an opening in between all the yickety yak, yackety yak stuff. And then you'd hear Krishna Krishnamurti's voice going, please, 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 madams, sirs, I love that part. Isn't that great? In the middle of <laughs> all that, please, Madam Serves, can we come back to the point? The purpose. And he would go around and I was amazed at that. So, so I was telling my friend today, I said, you, if you still have that thought of ever of, uh, of this lady, yakety 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 yakety, once you get a little opening. <laughs> WWKD. What would Krishnamurti do with that little opening? And, you know, I'm sure it would start with, 
please, madam. <laughs> <laughs> there is no need to continue on that train of thought. <laughs> and, you know, that's the beauty of it. You could feel the love and the gentleness underneath, you know, re really just extending and radiating. And, and really, I just feel like we really get a lot of practice with that every day. You know, we have a lot of those opportunities. And, and all we're doing here is we're as mighty companions, we're helping cheer each other on to really to go for that. That we're worthy of that. We can be kind, we can be gentle, we can be polite. We don't need to confront, we just need to be firm and clear in our purpose. And, and gentleness will flow from that. And it may be direct. I just, I, just, I remember telling the same group, with this, um, you know, they would go on and on about their different, their lives and their families and their children and their, you know, attachments and so on and so forth. And so, after they went on for, we went on for days, weeks, months, years, at some point I would tell, I just would say, I'm just, I'm finally going to, I'm going to tell a Krishnamurti story to them. And they didn't like my story, but, but I finally would tell them, I said, there was a, a Course in Miracles teacher named Tara Singh, who uh, was, was a Sikh from India, who came over and taught the Course and had a group that he worked with for a number of years now. But, but back in the earlier years, um, Tara Singh came across Krishnamurti, and he was like, whoa, this is the real deal. He'd been in India, and he'd read the prophets, and over in India there's lots of saints and mystics and sannyasis and all kinds of yogis. But he came across Krishnamurti and went, oh, this is the real deal. So he just got it in his heart that if he could just have an audience and sit there with Krishnamurti and just kind of have an encounter with him and kind of pick his brain, he would have a really good chance, a better, much better chance at enlightenment, self-realization, if he could just have an encounter with him, talk to him. So the only thing was that Krishnamurti was on the move like, like this body's been. It's, from continent to continent to continent. He's like moving, 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 always moving. And a lot of people around him. I don't really have a lot of bodies around him, except for my three-legged cat. Only one that seems to stay, but most of the other. But Krishnamurti had a number. Might have even been an entourage. But anyway, going around, doing his talks around the world and everything. And, and Krishnamurti's going from continent to continent. He's continent hopping to try to get an audience. Some people did that with Sai Baba too, and Sai Baba was alive. They wanted the, the darshan, they wanted the gaze of Sai Baba. They would go hoping to get a time with him. And so, Krishnamurti goes from continent to continent to continent, trying to get an audience with, or, or Tara Singh does, with Krishnamurti. And finally it happens. Finally he gets his audience. So I was telling the students, I said, you want to know how it went? They said, yeah, tell us. And Krishnamurti sits down with him and looks, they both gaze into each other's eyes and Krishnamurti just looks in. So Tara Singh starts and says, I want to know who I am, I want enlightenment. I want self-realization. What to, you know, know I'm the one. And it goes on and on and on. Three or four minutes with this stuff. Krishnamurti speaks.
three words. What's stopping you? Back to Tarsing. Well, I, I have a family. I'm a householder. And I have you know, children and obligations and yeah, my attachments and he spills the beans. Krishna just looks at him, doesn't break the eye gaze. Here it comes. The final two words of the dialogue from Krishna Murray. The end of the encounter. Just looks Krishna Murray in the eyes. Drop them. I don't know why people don't like that story, though. <laughs> I love that story. Right. <laughs> I was like, wow. Amazing. Five words. <laughs> but it's direct. And, and, you know, I think for those that go into spirituality, they, they do want to know God. They want to know their divine reality, their self. And it's like that old parable from the East, you know, where they, the guru takes the guy and the guy goes on and on about talking about wanting God and self-realization and the guru you know, dunks him, puts the head down in the water and keeps the, guy, the devotee's head under the water, struggling, struggling, and then when the guy comes up he's like, ah! <laughs> he's got a giant, giant breath, a giant in-breath after he's been held under and everything. And the guru says, when you want to know God as much as you just wanted that next breath, you will know God. <laughs> so it's getting back to desire, you know. If we have all kinds of desires for all kinds of things, then God kind of is on the shelf somewhere, you know. God is, is in there somewhere in the mix, but there's just so many that seem to be on the plate, you know, the, the defiled altar is splintered with desires for many things. So it fits, it kind of fits in with the Krishnamurti story, like Krishnamurti was just offering Tara Singh the greatest gift, mm -hmm. just saying, ah, oh, good, good, I'm going to give it to you straight, <laughs> you know, not sugarcoat it or dance around, beat around the bush, you know, and, and I think that's, that's the vibe that we start to resonate with more and more, you know. Even for those that go on the spiritual journey, there can be a lot of, you know, depression or rage, frustrations, challenges, difficulties. Maybe even more so than what seemed to be the, the old life. Almost like it seems to at some point like intensify, like, what did I get, what, what can of worms did I get into? And, what did I take the lid off of, you know, and swing, this, like a clown act, you know, it's like all this stuff comes springing out. But, but then again, you know, if, if that's the desire to know thyself, you know, and really to experience that peace, then, you know, we do cultivate that desire, you know, that Jesus said, let thine eye be single. He, he didn't say, let thy eye be multiple, you know, he, he said, let thy eye be single. So, he was, he was giving us the direction towards unified thought, towards unified purpose. And think about the world, everything that you perceive in the world has a different purpose. Purpose of a cup, purpose of a candle. The purpose of a cup to the ego is a lot different than the purpose of a candle, or the purpose of a book, or the purpose of an iPhone, or the purpose of a watch, or the purpose of a foot, or the purpose of a nose. Everything in this world, in this entire cosmos, has a different purpose. Everything. 
We even have like with forks. We have different kinds of forks. <laughs> Longer forks, what, have a different purpose than shorter forks. Bigger spoons, we have teaspoons <laughs> for our tea, our coffee. We have tablespoons because they're for different things. If you're baking a cake or you're making a casserole or something and you use the, the wrong size of spoon, it's going to make the thing taste different. We have different kind of cars, we have different bodies, we have different bank accounts. And even with money, you know, there's different purposes that's given to the money. And one's a college fund, one's to buy cat food, one's to have for the candy stash. You know, we have different accounts. It's everything, everything, everything in the world has a different purpose. And then there must be a purpose that is going to take us out of this menagerie of, of complexity and multiplicity. There must be some, a purpose in our mind that's going to unify our, our thoughts, that's going to unify our perception. A unified purpose. Which again, is forgiveness. That's what Jesus was very single-minded on teaching forgiveness. He, he used a lot of parables and a lot of different ways of approaching the same topic, but and that's what the Course is. It just keeps coming around and around and around. Did you get it? Okay, let's try this one. Did you get it? It's very symphonic. You know, you could, you could pop the thing open like I did and still get it. You don't even have to read it in a linear way. Although I would recommend doing the lessons that way because he said so. Don't do more than one lesson a day. And as best you can, don't make exceptions. So, you know, I say follow the instructions, but... Well, I just was in Honolulu and... And, uh... One was asking me, you know, how do I know which part to do first? The text, the workbook, the menu. I really am drawn to the workbook. Is it alright? Can I just skip the text and just jump right in? I said, it's highly individual. If that's your guidance, then go for it. I'm not gonna try to give you any kind of answer other than that. You know, just feel it out. If you're attracted to it, then maybe you're one of those that wants to jump right into the lab. Like in science class, you don't, don't read the manual, don't do the homework, and you get right out there and get the test tubes and, I'm here, okay, let's try it out. What happens when you mix this and this? It explodes. <laughs> okay. All right, I'll read, the, I'll read the text next time. But, you know, we learn through experiences. So, you know, it was kind of fun. But I, I, I think, you know, we always come back to it's highly individualized, so, so we start coming back to how do you feel in your heart? What are you drawn to? You know, and that you can trust that. You don't have to kind of go try to find the expert to tell you how you're going to do A Course in Miracles. Then I had Armel sitting next to me who, she said, yeah, I was in the course for two months. Got some people in the audience have been doing it for 25 years. <laughs> so I, I was in it for two months and I found David. Yeah. And the more I joined and connected and everything, eh, the less I felt guided to read the course. And I haven't read the whole thing. Ha! Ah, no, I haven't. <laughs> You know, and glowing and happy and radiant. And, well, damn. But she gave the whole story, you know. It's, it was more about the connecting, the joining, the linking in, the make no exception, you know, just desire, determination. It's, that's what it's all about. It's not about moving your eyes over, over the words. And, yeah, and then, yeah, the more we got into it, the 
more she just as she's done here when I've done things, she just go into meditation. Occasionally I'd say a word or something and she'd smile. I'd say, huh, oh, still paying a little attention in there. <laughs> she yeah, would we'll just go off into blissful states and then yeah, at one point over there in Honolulu it's like yep. She couldn't really move her body very well, so I, I said that ask if they had a closet in the place. It was a Unity Church, a small little I said, found a closet, I found some pillows and mattresses, took her hand, steadied her body carefully, got her up out of the chair and across over there to the closet <laughs> and put her in this closet just long enough to fit the body in there. <laughs> closed the door. One lady did open the door one time with her, when she was talking on the cell phone, but I don't think Carmel even knew that happened. It was dark in there. It had an air conditioner running in the closet. It was a nice closet. But, so, you know, it's just like, you just go with the flow of things, you know? It's, which, that's what she likes. She likes sometimes just to hear the spirit coming out of me like a cadence, and then she just lets go of the words and the sounds, and then just drifts into it and loses awareness of the body. And, it's great, and people love it too. They all had a great, great <laughs> workshop, and we're all happy. There was one point where she was in meditation, and I had said a bunch of things, and her eyes were open, so I put the microphone right over in front of her mouth, and she went, Yes! <laughs> <laughs> and one woman there went, Oh, I felt it. <laughs> Always one little yes, but it was yes. It was like all the universe was behind it. <laughs> she felt the presence of the the presence behind the word, and she was the one we were staying with. Barbara. She was like, "Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you for that." <laughs> so it was to make a good comedy team, like Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's just another good thing. It's not. It's not so much in the words, it's, it's just all in the purpose, which, which really is a, it's all in the presence. It's not something that we actually teach and learn verbally. It's more the presence, the Spirit's using the mechanism of the body and the words just to come deeper and deeper into that stillness beyond the words, or like Mozart said this, the gaps of silence between the notes was the thing that Mozart was most captivated by. Not, not the notes, not the melody. It was the gaps of silence. And I think that's a good metaphor for the spiritual journey. You know, if you let it all get used, and you don't hold back with anything, and then it's just after a while, it's like, hmm, that's good. Total, our Mel kept saying, oh, that's my favorite word, allowance. Allowance. Just allow, allow, allow. It's good. So she would go into these uh, deep states of just being and not really, not totally um, letting the mind or the ego. She'd go into pure consciousness. Yeah, that's the practice. Yeah, whether you're you're sitting, whether your eyes are closed, whether they're open, whether the body's moving or not. In many of these cases, like you know, we've done some satsangs here where, where yeah, it just was, you know, slowly coming back into the awareness of the body and and going out and so forth. It's it's just part of the practice. Jesus talks about that. He does say in the, in the workbook at one point, and you can tell that you've practiced well by this, the body will not feel at all. That's an interesting word. Right? You can tell that you've practiced well by this, the body will not feel at all. Because the body doesn't feel. The mind tells the body how to feel. It's like if you were watching a movie, you know, it's, we could say intellectually, well, it's a bunch of shadows, shadows, colored shadows or black and white shadows on, on the wall. 
but and there's there's sounds associated with it and this and this, but it's not real life. It's the world we call real life. It's a motion picture. It's it's just shadows on the wall, but. But the meaning gets read into it as if these are actual people and actual events. And like you're there, you get if you watch the movie, you can get sucked into the movie as if you're there in the movie, psychologically at least, you know. And and that's I have given everything I see all the meaning that it has. And and you could say that about even even the body. There's a lot of spirituality that talk about, a lot about the breath, and the kundalini energy, and the different energy systems with the body, and the chakras, and there are those that, that say, trust your body, um, let your body tell you, you know, how to go, um, let your body tell you what it feels, it's, it's well, once you def understand divine metaphysics, that. Uh, literally, the mind tells the body what to feel. The, the mind is everything. Not mind the way Eckhart or some people talk about it as opposed to the heart. You know, oh, get out of your mind and get into your heart. But just talking about mind as Jesus uses mind in the Course. It's, it's all encompassing. You know, he says, you are mind, holy mind, and purely mind at one point in the Course. and. And there's nothing outside of the mind, and and he's got some uh, saying the mind is everywhere, you within it, and it within you. You know, it just uses these words to talk about it as this all-encompassing uh, thing. Not really a thing as we think of things, but divine mind, mind of God, idea in the mind of God, mind, mind. But when I'm talking about mind in that way, I'm just saying. It's, in terms of with the body, the body does not feel. That, that seems to contradict human experience. But remember, the ego made up the body, and it made up the world, and it made up the feelings. For the most part, we could say that the body seems to experience, certainly pleasure and pain. And a lot of the feelings that, of, of the stress, there's like sometimes a tightness, like a tightness in the muscles and everything that you can make up all that up, and it's it's made up the whole system. And yeah, the egoic mind, you know, tells the body what to feel. There's even a lot of spiritualities and that teach that the body and the cells contain memories. You've heard of cellular memory? Mm -hmm. No? Cells don't contain memories. Sorry, Candace Pert or whoever, you know, all the different ones. No, no such thing as cellular memory. Cells of a body? Cells of matter containing memory? Memory is a mechanism of the mind, and you can either use memory to remember God, which is the helpful use of memory, remember the holy instant, remember the present moment, or you can, like in the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind, you can let memory wander off into time and space and have all these memories of the past. And those memories can be painful memories, or pleasurable memories. Um, that's part of the ego uses memory to perpetuate the belief in linear time. You have a pleasurable memory from where? The past. Mm -hmm. And you go, hmm, I like it. And then you want to repeat. Mm -hmm. Repeat that pleasurable memory. Where do you think linear time is coming from? Skip over the present and and anticipation. Probably Simon song. We can never know about the things to come. 
but we think about them anyway. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if I'm really with you now, <laughs> or just thinking about some final day. Anticipation, <laughs> anticipation is making me wait, keeping me wait. Mm. It's there in the songs too. We can discover that if we have memories from the past that we like and we want to repeat them, or think about it the other way, memories of pain, memories of pain, and we want to avoid them in the future. We call this health insurance. <laughs> the doctors don't like to do that. But nurses. But when you get down to the core of it, it's, we're always talking about this time issue. You know, linear time, linear time. And, and how do we allow it to be dismantled except, you know, really learn to live in the moment and accept the present moment. Ex dip down into that stillness, drop down into that, that bliss. That's what meditation is truly designed to do. If you ever go to Vipassana, yeah, that's what Vipassana is all about. Letting go of this, dropping down, sinking down into the, the stillness. Beautiful technique for that. So, yeah, the point I was making too is, that, you know, back to cellular memory. You know, you don't. The body can reflect a lot of things. Sometimes people will will go to body work or the massage or lots of different things, rebirthing and on and on, and on circular breathing and different things, and they. They will feel as if, when there's a huge release, that it seems to release in a certain part of the body. Mm -hmm. And you know what? The ego is behind, is telling you what you feel in certain parts of the body, too. Remember, the ego made the body, and the ego made up discomfort and pain and suffering. And the flip side of what painful suffering in the body is, is like a release feeling. But what we're saying is, it's mind. It's all mind. Healing in mind is the name of the book. <laughs> it's not healing the cellular memory. It doesn't, it's not titled that. It's not healing the molecules. It's not healing the electrons or healing the parts. You heal the mind by seeing the mind as whole. And you can't find it in the parts. And the deeper you go, you undo and dismantle a lot of spiritualities, a lot of theologies, a lot of religions. You know, it's it's back to coming empty, just coming empty, and say, "Oh my gosh, I was wrong about." That. I read that in a book, cellular memory stuff, and I had a rebirthing experience. Mm -hmm. That seemed pretty real to me too, Jesus. fun. It is fun. Mm -hmm. An awake mind is fun. Mm -hmm. It's playful, it's humorous, it's light. Mm -hmm. It is fun. It's that other stuff sells books. <laughs> Commerce. But, you know, and it's the same with, you know, this Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code and all these things. That fascinating. People Somebody already complained to me about Gary Renard's latest book, and Conspiracy. Dick Cheney, Vice President of the United States, connected to 9-11, the towers coming down. 
population doesn't like those kinds. Is it the mean terrorist? Vicious? Saw Bush. Saudi Arabia? Or what? Vice President of the United States? No. The people say to me, why put that in a book about forgiveness? We're trying to learn that there's no victims, <laughs> no victimizers, no, nothing's gone wrong in the world. Because why? Because it's not out there. It's a projection. Why tell those kind of stories? Or about the Federal Reserve? It's another one. Oh, Federal Reserve. Monetary policies, doing things, innocent people, losing jobs, losing pensions. Why? Why talk about these things? Conspiracies? Is it, are they true? Are they not true? Did it really happen? Okay. Remember Jason one time, he came to me a few years ago and he, he was he was still thinking about 9-11 and the Twin Towers coming down. Even though I had forecast that in one of my old talks from years ago, I talked about the World Trade Center lighting up and coming down. People gave me calls when, when it happened. But he was concerned about, he said that his, you know, his father and you know, brothers and the family and everything, he, he said, I, what I'm concerned about is that if I bring up this idea that the Twin Towers coming down, the World Trade Center coming down, was a conspiracy. You know, was, there were, there were, the government was mm -hmm. actually involved with it or anything. He said, I'm afraid that you will react to that. I said, me? React to that? <laughs> I said, why would I react to that? He said, well, you know, it just seems, so maybe you're mistaking me for an American or something, from the spirit, but uh, <laughs> patriotic concepts going on there, but I said, me? He said, well, I, I just think if I bring that up as a, as a hypothetical, that actually it was, a it was an inside job, and there's evidence you know, movies and they show slow motion and, and they couldn't have done, you know, an But I <laughs> would somehow contest that and tell him no. I, he was afraid I would tell him no. It's, no, it's not a conspiracy. No, the answer I told him, I said, well, both of those hypotheticals, the towers coming down because terrorist planes hit the towers, and towers coming down because there was a conspiracy and they had bombs planted that the government had to do and the thing dismantled and it kind of optical illusion looked like the planes had something to do with it. Both of those alternatives have false cause and effect premises. One that there was whatever bombs or something going on inside and the other is the planes hit them and knocked them down. And they're both equally false. They're both equally false. Why? Because God didn't create either one of them. They're both equally false interpretations and scenarios of what Shakespeare called much ado about nothing. We have nothing here, nothing there, and you're concerned that I will react when you say this nothing happened, instead of that nothing. But nothing is nothing. <coughs> I came to Hawaii, I came to Kalani, did a talk with Gary Renard, and Gary was, at that point, was, was head of hagglers and people saying that he had he had plagiarized um, the book of Thomas with Persa, what she said in the book, and he plagiarized, and 
blah, 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 all these things. And then people were really razzing on the case too, that, that art and person weren't really real, they didn't really appear in that couch, on that couch in Maine, and he made the whole thing up, and it was all fictitious, and just, he was just making a lot of money, and he made the whole thing up. So, I decided to use that moment with Gary, since we're sitting side by side, to talk about duality, and how different things that are so important to, in the world, people talking around, whether something happened, or it didn't happen. Whether they came, and were on the couch, and spoke, actually, or whether it was just a literary device, and he's lying about them coming, and all this and this. I said, they're both the same. Scenario, art and Persa, there, actually, not there. Two different scenarios. And they're both the same. Because they're both personal interpretations. And both, in the world of duality, they seem to be opposites. And the big question is, which one's true? Did he tell the truth or did he lie? And I just did my best to say, extend, that, that, that again, you can't tell the difference in this world between true scenarios and fiction, because why? Because it's all fiction. <laughs> this is fiction, and this is fiction. And why would you argue, and fight, and project, and blame, and accuse, even, if this is fiction, and this is fiction? It's all fiction. That's what the teachings of the Course are. Nothing real can be threatened. That's spirit. Nothing unreal exists. That's perception. Here in lies the peace of God. I should say that's linear perception, again, because perception itself, all perception is false, but, but that linear perception of involving Arden and Persa and Gary and Maine, that's a, a personal scenario, and then Arden and Persa not coming, him just sitting there and writing them in. Arden, oh, that person's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Those are the same scenarios because those are fiction. <laughs> fiction. And I remember when I did it, Gary just smiled and he looked at the camera and he said, just for the record, they did come. <laughs> it happened. He's like, it really happened. Down boy. <laughs> so that's what we're going for. We're going for a deep spiritual awakening that, that sees that the error is in the mind. And perceiving the duality is erroneous perception. And we only do that when we look with the ego. When we're in the miracle, when everything's connected and we're we just are filled up with a feeling of total connectedness with everyone and everything. I mean, everything. There's no duality. No wonder there's no finger pointing, no accusations, no grievances in unified perception. Of course not. But you see, that's, that's really what this is about. That's why he says this is a course in mind training. It's just He's helping us train our minds to that perspective. And that fits in with that email I got today, too. You know, it's this idea of court cases. And I remember when the course had the seven court cases going on around the copyright, I would go around and people would actually ask me the question, whose side are you on? <laughs> and I'd be like, 
<laughs> Are we reading the same book? <laughs> <laughs> Side of you. Who do you back? <laughs> Who do I back? Jesus. Who are you supporting? What do you mean? Which side do I support? Yeah. Well, are you just going to sit around like a lump? <laughs> do nothing. It's very important controversial issues. <laughs> I will listen to what Jesus has to say and mm -hmm. see. And actually Jesus didn't have this body sit around like a lump. Again, traveling up to Wisconsin to hug people in the Denver Academy, and then out to Nebraska to hug people in Nebraska that were involved in one of the lawsuits, and then out to California to hug Ken Wapnick. So I actually did not, was not guided to sit like a lump. Actually there was an action component, but it was quite simple. It was actually, go hug them. Hug them. Hold them, hug them. I wasn't even guided to speak. I wasn't guided to say, are you crazy? <laughs> Getting involved in a lawsuit? No, none of that. None of that. Just be silent and hug and express love. And then if anyone asks you something, then Jesus said, I will speak, speak through you. Nobody asked me anything in Endeavor Academy. I really got to hug them. And Ken did not ask me anything either. He just said, promise me one thing. Promise me. He slipped it in. He said, promise me that you won't save the world. And the little voice inside went, too late. <laughs> but I didn't, there was nothing to speak. But actually, when I was in Nebraska, they did actually say to me, they said, well, David, what would you do about this whole thing? So that was kind of interesting to have that question. And I said, I drop it. And they said, well, we've got a lot of money invested in this thing, a lot of time. Yeah. I drop it. So, money and time. Mm -hmm. Interesting words. To justify a lawsuit. Very interesting. It's part of that email today. People trying to make a profit on the course, money issues or whatever. But really, we don't need to accuse anybody of anything, really. And we don't need to figure out anything or even advise people. It's really looking at those things like, hmm, is money have any value to me? is a better question. And does time have any value to me? Linear time. That's those are are helpful helpful questions because it points you inward to take a look at do I is, is my mind invested in any way? You see how how fruitful and helpful that is, as opposed to trying to advise somebody and say, well, I should do this, I shouldn't do that. So, yeah, it's, 
it's kind of getting away from the old habit of advising just and coming to self-honesty in your heart. That's really, that's really a fast track. Just being really self-honest. How do I feel about it? Am I invested in time or money? Somebody once told me, time is money. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, that's true. Money or time and money are both devices that, that we really wouldn't want to focus on. If it keeps us distracted from peace of mind, then you know, we don't want to put too much attention on those kind of things that were invented, so that we can come back to creation, you know, to spirit. That's where we want our attention, to the spirit and to stillness. <clears throat> um, it's probably because of, of my conditioning and what I'm used to understanding that some of these concepts um, it's just really hard to get and maybe it's because uh, we are so used to thinking in duality that we can't understand unity and so when you say things to me like both stories are fiction it's like my mind goes berserk it's like it doesn't <clears throat> know where to land it gets like twisted because I, I want, I think I <coughs> value rationality or understanding what's going on or understanding the truth. And I don't know where <coughs> to put that, what you just said, both stories are fiction. Well, what is real? What's not real? Yeah, it, it does, you can see where it's like a, like a loosening or a, it could even be, there could even be like a, like a disorientation yeah, I feel comes, disoriented and confused. Yeah, when, when you start to go for this, but I think of things like, like in our legal system, when somebody goes in and they have you put your hand on the Bible, and they say, do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? And they're speaking about words, you know, telling the truth, <clears throat> you know, telling what actually happened. And so, that's the frustrating thing about linear time, is that how many people have been in relationships where you're in a relationship and you say things about the future or the past, maybe you will just say the future, I'll love you forever, we'll never be apart, or whatever things that people say, and then at some point it doesn't work out that way. There's, there's something that seems to not have been kept. Promise is not kept. That's probably right up there with divorces, you know, promise is not kept. So you start, you have to start to first open your mind and start to realize that truth is not really confined at all to words, you know. Words are pretty crude symbols. You can have people that try to talk it through that really have trouble reaching that harmony through the words. The ancient Greeks were quite good with words and they even had disagreements, you know, even though they were quite deep, I would say, and had quite a lot of harmony and integrity, they still had their disagreements. And, you know, some of you probably remember Gloria, is it Gloria Esteban, one of her songs? But the words get in the way, there's so much I want to say. I try to say I love you, but the words get in the way. You know, it's, the words, we're, we're not going to find the truth in the words. And, and we can start to see that, you know, even the Course says, truth cannot be described or explained, but only experienced. We're back to that key word experience. It's not a theology, it's not words, it's not concepts. And so, what I'm talking about, it definitely is pointing towards an experience and that there's a lot of, like, letting go, a lot of 
clearing out, a lot of emptying out, truly, that, that is part of it. That's, that's part of the authentic journey. Thinking we know something and then letting go of that, what we think we know, and opening, and opening to be shown. I do not know the way, but show me. I'm open to being wrong about my perceptions of the world. Show me. Show me another way to look at it. Beautiful, beautiful. So, yeah, that's really deep what I was just sharing about those scenarios. But this is where divine metaphysics come in, in the sense that, again, you know how I started off this talk, I'll, I'll end the talk. Since I've gone a little bit past 8.30, we don't care about time. <laughs> uh, but I started off by saying, you know, you know, we get apples from apple trees, and pears from pear trees, you know, and bananas from banana trees, and, and why wouldn't we think that we would get spirit from spirit, you know, if, if we're getting down to the core of God, if God is love, why wouldn't we think we are love? If God is spirit, we're spirit. If God is infinite, we're infinite, you know, if all that has to apply. And, and therefore, God is not the creator of form, because form, by definition, is finite, is temporary, is changing. We could say all those things about form. And we don't speak of God as finite. We never speak of God as changing, but here today, gone tomorrow, <laughs> can't count on God. Uh, we don't talk about God as limited in any way, uh, or oneness, or love, you know, unless you're talking about romantic love, and again, horizontal, that just, that's not the oneness. So, yeah, I would say the reason it can seem a little bit disorienting is because you start to open up to these divine metaphysics, and, first of all, that can be a little bit shocking, you know, you really, I was raised Christian, you know, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, what? God created the heavens and the ego projected the earth? You're messing with some real basic stuff there, you're messing with Genesis. <laughs> Better not say that in public. You know, self-concept, self-concept. You know, who cares if you say it in public or not? It's it's like, is it true or not? And, and even that's, it's just words that are taking us in a good direction because, because we start to get a hold of divine logic. Whereas lo there's nothing wrong with logic. You know, I I love logic, but what if your first premise in your logical statement is false? You know, we know what happens with that. Right? But everything else that follows from the, a wrong first premise. And what if all of our sciences and a lot of the books that we've read and a lot of what we've seen to learn in school and through experience even in this world, what if it's based on the belief that cause and effect are apart and linear time is a reality? And what if we bought this whole linear joke hook, line, and sinker, and never once stop to go, maybe not. Mm -hmm. and what if we go to a, a party, and you know, you're dancing, having a good time, and someone comes across the room and comes up to go and, and says, where are you from? What if we were really honest? And we told them the truth instead of giving them a line. If we said, heaven. That's more true, but we have to come to the experience of that, even saying the words, you know, it's just a word. So, yeah, I think that's the beautiful thing is, some of these divine metaphysics and divine logic, you know, seem to shake things up a bit, because, honestly, that old linear logical system, you know, it, it holds, in a linear way, but does it hold ultimately in terms of what's real and true and 
And that's where the Course has been so helpful in my life. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. That's, that's a little bit of logic there. I call that divine logic. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. There's something in my heart that leaped up when I first read the summary of A Course in Miracles, because I was, huh, well, I'll be. <laughs> and then the ego goes, you cannot be serious. <laughs> you cannot be serious with that one. You know, because it's like, you, it would have to mean that everything <laughs> that you've ever experienced in this world is an illusion, if that's true. But there's something inside that goes, yeah, it's, it's, it sounds true. And what's real is love. Yeah. That's, that, that's the bottom line. Love cannot be threatened. Nothing other than love exists. Herein lies love. <laughs> Herein lies the peace of God. You know, it's, that if you took the same thing and you used that word love, oneness cannot be threatened. Nothing but oneness exists, or nothing other than oneness exists. Here lies the truth. That's putting it in other words, that's laying it straight. That, that you can't have duality and non-duality, you can't have oneness and one and two are not the same. I mean, the numbers are in this world because they're, they're both invented by the ego. But oneness <laughs> and two-ness or duality or multiplicity, whatever you want, they, they can't actually be the same. And because that's more of an ultimate, that's ultimate divine logic tells us that. Inspired logic tells us that. Linear logic. Yep, I was in university for 10 years. Bit that one. Took a lot of studies and a lot of papers, a lot of classes, trying to figure something out. But needed a good dose of divine logic to say, stop that. Stop. Stop your mind. Gandhiji likes to say it too. Stop! <laughs> Stop! So, it's like, okay. Okay. Good. All right. I will. <laughs> ah. Okay, thank you all. That was... Thank <laughs> 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 <laughs>